Adventures in American Literature, Benjamin Franklin, 1706 to 1790. The first American, as Benjamin Franklin has been called, was born in the capital of New England, Puritanism, Boston, just as Puritanism was dying out. He left Boston at the age of 17, but Puritan ideals stayed with him. As Puritans hoped to be made pure by God's grace, he tried to make himself morally perfect by self-discipline. He failed to do so, but he did carry out another kind of self-transformation. By cleverness and hard work, he changed himself from the poorly educated son of a candle and soap maker into a famous, world-famous scientist, diplomat, philosopher, and writer. A few paragraphs cannot describe but only list Franklin's many interests and accomplishments. He made his living mostly as a hard-working Philadelphia printer, but he also helped improve the city's pavements, street lighting, sanitation, fire companies, and police, ran a magazine and a newspaper, founded or helped to found a debating club, a hospital, the American Philosophical Society, the first circulating library in America, and the college that became the University of Pennsylvania, studied earthquakes, ocean currents, and wind, improved or invented the lightning rod, bifocal eyeglasses, a device for lifting books off high shelves, a rocking chair that could swat flies, a musical instrument made of moistened glass bowls called the harmonica, and a stove that was sold throughout America and Europe, addressed the English House of Commons on the Stamp Act, drew an important political cartoon, and served as first postmaster general of America, assisted in creating the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States, discovered the laws of electricity, for which he won honorary degrees from Harvard and Yale, and a gold medal from the English Royal Academy, and became perhaps the first American millionaire. Franklin was also a brilliant writer. Following his precept that writing should be smooth, clear, and short, he perfected the Puritan plain style. He kept a huge correspondence and wrote on everything from love to musical harmony to chess. Most popular among his earlier works were the poor Richard Almanacs, noted for their witty sayings. According to one story, the Continental Congress was afraid to let him draft the Declaration of Independence because he might slip a joke into it. During the war, he wrote cutting satires on British policy, such as an edict by the King of Prussia. In 1771, he began his autobiography, describing his rise from poverty and obscurity to a state of affluence and some degree of reputation, uh, reputation in the world. Although never completed, the autobiography has been translated into a dozen languages and read by millions. The contrast between Franklin's humble beginnings and his vast success made him a symbol of America, and like America, he has had his critics. Some have questioned his sincerity. He praised reason, but once called it a guide quite blind. He wished to benefit mankind, but told a doctor that half the lives you save are not worth saving as being useless, and almost all the other half ought not to be saved as being mischievous. Such inconsistencies can be viewed as a sign of Franklin's belief in self-development. He refused to be held out uh, he refused to be held to outmoded opinions, viewed less favorably. His inconsistencies suggested opportunism, a willingness to please in order to get ahead. Herman Melville, the author of Moby Dick, made a catalog of Franklin's roles, beginning printer, postmaster, almanac maker, essayist, chemist, orator. He ended with the one role Franklin ignored. Franklin was everything, Melville said, but a poet. Actually, Franklin did write some poems, but Melville's meaning is clear. Although Franklin mastered the practical side of life, he ignored the soul. Franklin's admirers then have seen him as resourceful and adaptable, a proof of the opportunities for success in America. His critics have seen him as a man who spent his life getting ahead without asking where he was going. No one can deny, however, that the first American lived with fabulous energy, perhaps growing, perhaps not, but always changing, always new from the autobiography. My brother had, in 1720 or 21, begun to print a newspaper. It was the second that appeared in America and was called the New England Courant. The only one before it was the Boston 
newsletter, I remember his being dissuaded by some of his friends from the undertaking as not likely to succeed, one newspaper being, in their judgment, enough for America. At this time, 1771, there are not less than five and twenty. He went on, however, with the undertaking, and after having worked in composing the types and printing off the sheets, I was employed to carry the papers through the streets to the customers. He had some ingenious men among his friends who amused themselves by writing little pieces for this paper, which gained it credit and made it more in demand, and these gentlemen often visited us. Hearing their conversations and their accounts of the approbation their papers were received with, I was excited decided to try my hand among them, but, being still a boy, and suspecting that my brother would object to printing anything of mine in his paper, if he knew it to be mine, I contrived to disguise my hand, and, writing an anonymous paper, I put it in at night under the door of the printing house. It was found in the morning and communicated to his writing friends when they called in as usual. They read it, commented on it in my hearing, and I had the exquisite pleasure of finding it met with their approbation, and that, in their different guesses at the author, none were named but men of some character among us for learning and ingenuity. I suppose now that I was rather lucky in my judges, and perhaps they were not really so very good ones as I then esteemed them. Encouraged, however, by this, I wrote and conveyed in some way to press several more papers, which were equally approved, and I kept my secret till my small fund of sense for such performances was pretty well exhausted, and then I discovered it, when I began to be considered a little more by my brother's acquaintance, and in a manner that did not quite please him, as he thought, probably with reason, that it tended to make me too vain, and perhaps this might be one occasion of the differences that we frequently had about this time. Though a brother, he considered himself as my master, and me his apprentice, and accordingly expected the same services from me as he would from another, while I thought he demeaned me too much in some he required of me, who from a brother expected more indulgence. Our disputes were often brought before our father, and I fancy I was either generally in the right or else a better pleader, because the judgment was generally in my favor. But my brother was passionate and had often beaded me, which I took extremely amiss, and thinking my apprenticeship very tedious, I was continually wishing for some opportunity of shortening it, which at length offered in a manner unexpected. One of the pieces in our newspaper, on some political point which I have now forgotten, gave offence to the assembly. He was taken up, censured, and imprisoned for a month by the speaker's warrant, I suppose because he would not discover the author. I, too, was taken up and examined before the council, but, though I did not give them any satisfaction, they contented themselves with admonishing me and dismissed me, considering me, perhaps, as an apprentice who was bound to keep his master's secrets. During my brother's confinement, which I resented a good deal, notwithstanding our private differences, I had the management of the paper, and I made bold to give our rulers some rubs in it which my brother took very kindly, while others began to consider me in an unfavorable light, as a young genius that had a turn for libeling and satire. My brother's discharge was accompanied with an order of the house, a very odd one, that James Franklin should no longer print the paper called the New England Courant. And there was a consultation held in our printing house among his friends what he should do in this case. Some proposed to evade the order by changing the name of the paper. But my brother, seeing inconveniences in that, it was finally concluded on as a better way to let it be printed for the future under the name of Benjamin Franklin, and to avoid the censure of the assembly that might fall on him as still printing it by his apprentice. The contrivance was that my old indenture should be returned to me with a full discharge on the back of it to be shown on occasion to, to secure him the benefit of my service. I was to sign new indentures for the remainder of the term, which were to be kept private. A very flimsy scheme it was, but however it was immediately executed and the paper went on accordingly under my name for several months. 
At length, a fresh difference arising between my brother and me, I took upon me to assert my freedom, presuming that he would not venture to produce the new indentures. It was not fair in me to take this advantage, and this I therefore reckon one of the first errata of my life, but the unfairness of it weighed little with me when under the impression of resentment for the blows his passion too often urged him to bestow upon me, though he was now otherwise not an ill-natured man perhaps i was too saucy and provoking when he found i would leave him he took care to prevent my getting employment in any other printing house of the town by going round and speaking to every master who had accordingly refused to give me work i then thought of going to new york as the nearest place where there was a printer and i was rather inclined to leave boston when i reflected that it already made myself a little obnoxious to the governing party and from the arbitrary proceedings of the assembly in my brother's case it was likely i might if i stayed soon bring myself into scrapes a friend arranges for franklin's passage on a new york sloop so i sold some of my books to raise a little money was taken aboard privately and as we had a fair wind, in three days I found myself in New York, near three hundred miles from home, a boy of but seventeen, without the least recommendation to, or knowledge of, any person in the place, and with very little money in my pocket. My inclinations for the sea were by this time worn out, or I might now have grafted them, gratified them. But having a trade, and supposing myself a pretty good workman, I offered my service to the printer in the place, Mr. William Bradford, who had been the first printer in Pennsylvania, but removed from thence upon the quarrel of George Keefe, he could give me no employment, having little to do, and help enough already, but, says he, my son at Philadelphia has lately lost his principal hand, Aquila Rose, by death. If you go thither, I believe he may employ you. Philadelphia was one hundred miles farther. I set out, however, in a boat for Amboy, leaving my chest and things to follow me round by the sea. In crossing the bay, we met with a squall that tore our rotten sails to pieces, prevented our getting into the kill, and drove us upon Long Island. One of the passengers, a Dutchman, falls overboard, and Franklin rescues him. When we drew near the island, we found it was a at a place where there could be no landing there being a great surf on the stony beach so we dropped anchor and swung round towards the shore some people came down to the water edge and hallowed to us as we did to them but the wind was so high and the surf so loud that we could not hear so as to understand each other there were canoes on the shore and we made signs and hallowed that they should fetch us but they either did not understand us or thought it impracticable so they went away, and night coming on, we had no remedy but to wait till the wind should abate, and in the meantime the boatman and I concluded to sleep if we could, and so crowded into the scuttle with the Dutchman, who was still wet, and the spray beating over the head of our boat leaked through to us, so that we were soon almost as wet as he. In this manner we lay all night with very little rest, but the wind abating the next day, we made a shift to reach Amboy before night, having been thirty hours on the water, without victuals or any drink but a bottle of filthy rum, the water we sailed on being salt. In the evening I found myself very feverish, and went into bed, but having read somewhere that cold water drunk plentifully was good for a fever, I followed the prescription, sweat plentifully most of the night, my fever left me, and in the morning, crossing the ferry, I proceeded on my journey on foot, having fifty miles to Burlington, where I was told that I should find boats that would carry me the rest of the way to Philadelphia. It rained very hard all the day. I was thoroughly soaked, and by noon a good deal tired, so I stopped at a poor inn where I stayed all night, beginning now to wish I had never left home. 
I cut so miserable a figure, too, that I found, by the questions asked me, I was suspected to be some runaway servant, and in danger of being taken up on that suspicion. However, I proceeded the next day, and got in the evening to an inn, within eight or ten miles of Burlington, kept by one Dr. Brown. At his house I lay that night, and the next morning reached Burlington, but had the mortification to find that the regular boats were gone a little before my coming, and no other expected to go till Tuesday, this being Saturday, wherefore I returned to an old woman in the town of whom I bought gingerbread to eat on the water, and asked her advice. She invited me to lodge at her house till a passage by water should offer, and being tired with my foot traveling, I accepted the invitation. She, understanding, was a printer, would have had me stay at that town and follow my business, being ignorant of the stock necessary to begin with. She was very hospitable, gave me a dinner of ox cheek with great good will, accepting only a pot of ale in return, and I thought myself fixed till Tuesday should come. However, waking in the evening by the side of the river, a boat came, which I found was going towards Philadelphia with several people in her. They took me in, and as there was no wind, we rode all the way, and about midnight, not having yet seen the city, some of the company were confident we must have passed it, and would row no further, and all well, the others knew it not where we were. So we put towards the shore, got into a creek, landed near an old fence, with rails of which we made a fire, the night being cold in October, and there we remained till daylight. Then one of the company knew the place to be Cooper's Creek, a little above Philadelphia, which we saw as soon as we got out of the creek, and arrived there about eight or nine o'clock on the Sunday morning, and landed at the Market Street Wharf. I have been the more particular in this description of my journey, and shall be so of my first entry into that city, that you may, in your mind, compare such unlikely beginnings with the figure I have since made there. I was in my working dress, my best clothes being to come round by sea. I was dirty for my journey. My pockets were stuffed out with shirts and stockings. I knew no soul, nor where to look for lodging. I was fatigued with traveling, rowing, and want of rest. I was very hungry, and my whole stock of cash consisted of a Dutch dollar and about a shilling in copper. The latter I gave the people of the boat for my passage, who at first refused it, on account of my rowing, but I insisted on their taking it, a man being sometimes more generous when he has but a little money and when he has plenty, perhaps through fear of being thought to have but little. Then I walked up the street, gazing about, till near the market house I met a boy with bread. I had made many a meal on bread, and inquiring where he got it, I went immediately to the baker's he directed me to, in Second Street, and asked for biscuit, intending such as we had in Boston, but they, it seems, were not made in Philadelphia, and then I asked for a three-penny loaf, and was told that they had none such. So, not considering or knowing the difference of money, and the greater cheapness, nor the names of this bread, I bade him give me three penny worth of any sort. He gave me accordingly three great puffy rolls. I was surprised at the quantity, but took it, and, having no room in my pockets, walked off with a roll under each arm, and, eating the other. Thus, I went up the market street as far as Fourth Street, passing by the door of Mr. Reed, my future wife's father. When she, standing at the door, saw me, and thought I made, as I certainly did, a most awkward, ridiculous appearance, then I turned and went down Chestnut Street and part of Walnut Street, eating my roll all the way, and, coming round, found myself again at Market Street Wharf, near the boat that I came in, to which I went for a draught of the river water, and being filled with one of my rolls, gave the other to a woman and her child that came down the river in the boat with us, and we were waiting to go further. Thus refreshed, I walked again to the street, which by this time had many clean-dressed people in it, who were all walking the same way. I joined them, and thereby was led into the great uh, meeting-house of the Quakers near the market. I sat down among them, and after looking round a while and hearing nothing said, being very drowsy through the labor and want of rest, the preceding night, I fell 
fast asleep and continued so till the meeting broke when one was kind enough to rouse me this was therefore the first house i was in or slept in in philadelphia the following selection from the autobiography tells what happened six or seven years later after franklin had established himself as a philadelphia businessman it was about this time that i conceived the bold and arduous project project of arriving at moral perfection i wished to live without committing any fault at any time i would conquer all that either natural inclination custom or company might lead me into as i knew or thought i knew what was right and wrong i did not see why i might not always do the one and avoid the other but i soon found i had undertaken a task of more difficulty than i had imagined while my attention was taken up in guarding against one fault i was often surprised by another habit took the advantage of inattention inclination was sometimes too strong for reason i concluded at length that the mere speculative conviction that it was our interest to be completely virtuous was not sufficient to prevent our slipping and that the contrary habits must be broken and good ones acquired and established before we can have any dependence on a steady uniform rectitude of conduct for this purpose i therefore contrived the following method in the various enumerations of the moral virtues i had met with in my reading i found that catalogue more or less numerous as different writers included more or fewer ideas under the same name temperance for example was by some confined to eating and drinking while by others it was extended to mean the moderating every other pleasure appetite inclination or passion bodily or mental even to our avarice and ambition i proposed to myself for the sakes of or for the sake of clearness to use rather more names with fewer ideas annexed to each than a few names with more ideas and i included under thirteen names of virtues all that at that time occurred to me as necessary or desirable and annexed to each a short precept which fully expressed the extent i gave to its meaning these names of virtues with their precepts were number one temperance eat not to dullness drink not to elevation number two silence speak not but what may benefit others or yourself avoid trifling conversation number three order let all your things have their places let each part of your business have its time number four resolution resolve to perform what you ought perform without fail what you resolve number five frugality make no expense but to do good to others or yourself waste nothing number six industry lose no time be always employed in something useful cut off all unnecessary actions number seven sincerity use no hurtful deceit think innocently and justly and if you speak speak accordingly number eight justice wrong none by doing injuries or omitting the benefits that are your duty number nine moderation avoid extremes forbear resenting injuries so much as you think they deserve number ten cleanliness tolerate no uncleanliness in body clothes or habitation tranquillity be not disturbed at trifles or at accidents common or unavoidable number twelve chastity rarely use venery but for health or offspring never to dullness weakness or the injury of your own or another's peace or reputation number thirteen humility imitate jesus and socrates my intention being to acquire the habitude of all of these virtues, I judged it would be well not to distract my attention by attempting the whole at once, but to fix it on one of them at a time, and when I should be master of that, then to proceed to another, and so on until I have shall gone through the thirteen, and as the previous acquisition of some might facilitate the acquisition of certain others, I arrange them with that view as they stand above 
temperance first as it tends to procure the coolness and cleanness of head which is so necessary where constant vigilance was to be kept up and guard maintained against the unremitting attraction of ancient habits and the force of perpetual temptations this being acquired and established silence would be more easy and my desire being to gain knowledge at the same time that i improved in virtue and considering that in conversation it was obtained rather by the use of the ears than of the tongue and therefore wishing to break a habit i was getting into of prattling pruning and joking which only made me acceptable to trifling company i gave silence the second place this and the next order i expected would allow me more time for attending to my project and my studies resolution once become habitual would keep me firm in my endeavors to obtain all the subsequent virtues frugality and industry by freeing me from my remaining debt and producing affluence and independence would make more easy the practice of sincerity and justice etc etc conceiving then that agreeable to the advice of pythagoras in his golden verses daily examination would be necessary i contrived the following method for conducting that examination i made a little book in which i allotted a page for each of the virtues i ruled each page with red ink so as to have seven columns one for each day of the week marking each column with a letter for the day i crossed these columns with thirteen red lines marking the beginning of each line with the first letter of the one of the virtues on which line and in its proper column i might mark by a little black spot every fault i found upon examination to have been committed respecting that virtue upon that day i determined to give a week's strict attention to each of the virtues successively thus in the first week my grand guard was to avoid even the least offence against temperance leaving the other virtues to their ordinary chance only marking every evening the faults of the day thus if in the first week i could keep my first line marked t clear of spots i suppose the habit of that virtue so much strengthened and its opposite weakened that i might venture extending my attention to include the next and for the following week keep both lines clear of spots proceeding thus to the last i could go through a course complete in thirteen weeks and four courses in a year and like him who having a garden to weed does not attempt to eradicate all the bad herbs at once which would exceed his reach and strength but works on one of the beds at a time and having accomplished the first proceeds to a second so i should have i hoped the encouraging pleasure of seeing my pages the progress i made in virtue by clearing successively my lines of their spots till in the end by a number of courses i should be happy in viewing a clean book after a thirteen weeks daily examination the precept of order requiring that every part of my business should have its allotted time one page in my little book contained the following scheme of employment for the twenty-four hours of a natural day the morning question what good shall i do this day rise wash and address powerful goodness contrive day's business and take the resolution of the day prosecute the present study and breakfast work read or overlook my accounts and dine work put things in their proper places supper music or uh, diversion or conversation examination of the day evening question what good have i done today <laughs> and then sleep i entered upon the execution of this plan for self-examination and continued it with occasional intermissions for such time i was surprised to find myself so much fuller of faults than i had imagined but i had the satisfaction of seeing them dis diminish to avoid the trouble of renewing now and then my little book which by scrapping out the marks on the paper of old faults to make room for new ones in a new course became full of holes i transferred my tables and precepts to the ivory leaves of a memorandum book on which the lines were drawn with red ink 
that made a durable stain, and on those lines I marked my faults with a black lead pencil, which marks I could easily wipe out with a wet sponge. After a while, I went through one course only in a year, and afterward only one in several years, till at length I admitted them entirely. Being employed in voyages and business abroad, with a multiplicity of affairs that interfered, but I always carried my little book with me. My scheme of order gave me the most trouble, and I found that, though it might be practicable where a man's business was such as to leave him the disposition of his time, that of a journeyman printer, for instance, it was not possible to be exactly observed by a master, who must mix with the world and often receive people of business at their own hours. Order, too, with regard to places for things, paper, etc., I found extremely difficult to acquire. I had not been early accustomed to method, and, having an exceeding good memory, I was not so sensible of the inconvenience attending want of method. This article, therefore, cost me so much painful attention, and my faults in it vexed me so much, and I made so little progress in amendment, and had such frequent relapses that I was almost ready to give up the attempt, and content myself with a faulty character in that respect, like the man who, in buying an axe of a smith, my neighbor, desired to have the whole of its surface as bright as the edge. The smith consented to grind it bright for him if he would turn the wheel. He turned while the smith pressed the broad face of the axe hard and heavy on the stone, which made the turning of it very fatiguing. The man came every now and then from the wheel to see how the work went on, and at length would take his axe as it was without further grinding. No, says the smith, turn on, turn on, we shall have it bright by and by, as yet. "'Tis only speckled. Yes, says the man, but I think I like a speckled axe vexed, and I believe this man may have been the case with many, who, having for want of some such means as I employed, found the difficulty of obtaining good and breaking bad habits in other point of vice and virtue, have given up the struggle, and concluded that a speckled axe was best.' For something that pretended to be reason was every now and then suggested to me that such extreme nicety as I exacted of myself might be a kind of foppery in morals, which if it were known would make me ridiculous, and that a perfect character might be attended with the inconvenience of being envied and hated, and that a benevolent man should allow a few faults in himself to keep his friends in countenance. In truth, I found myself incorrigible with respect to order, and now I am grown old, and my memory bad, I feel very sensibly the want of it. But on the whole, though I never arrived at the perfection I had been so ambitious of obtaining, but fell far short of it, yet I was, by the endeavor, a better and happier man than I otherwise should have been if I had not attempted it as those who aim at perfect writing by imitating the engraved copies, though they never reach the wished-for excellence of those copies, their hand is mended by the endeavor, and is tolerable while it continues fair and legible. And it may well be my posterity should be informed that to this little artifice, with the blessing of God, their ancestor owed the constant felicity of his life down to his seventy-ninth year, in which this is written. What reverses may attend, the remainder is in the hand of providence, but if they arrive, the reflection on the past happiness over, uh, enjoyed ought to help his bearing them with more resignation. To temperance he ascribes his long-continued health, and what is still left to him of a good constitution. To industry and frugality, the early easiness of his circumstances and acquisition of his fortune with all that knowledge that enabled him to be a useful citizen and obtained for him some degree of reputation among the learned. To sincerity and justice, the confidence of his country and the honorable employs it conferred upon him. And to the joint influence of the whole mass of the virtues, even in the imperfect state he was able to acquire them, 
all that evenness of temper and that cheerfulness in conversation which makes his company still sought for and agreeable even to his younger acquaintance i hope therefore that some of my descendants may follow the example and reap the benefit from poor richard's almanac hunger is the best pickle keep thy shop and thy shop will keep thee love your neighbor yet don't pull down your hedge a slip of the foot you may soon recover but a slip of the tongue you may never get over early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy wealthy and wise god helps them that help themselves don't throw stones at your neighbors if your own windows are glass he that scatters thorns let him not go barefoot three may keep a secret if two of them are dead tart words make no friends a spoonful of honey will catch more flies than a gallon of vinegar fish and visitors smell in three days if you would know the value of money try to borrow some a small leak will sink a great ship he that lieth down with dogs shall rise up with fleas now that i have a sheep and a cow everybody bids me good morrow drive thy business let it not drive thee dost thou love life then do not squander time for that's the stuff that life is made of. A Printer's Epitaph The body of B. Franklin, printer, Like the cover of an old book, Its contents worn out, And it's stripped of its lettering and gilding, Lies here food for worms, But the work shall not be wholly lost, for it will, as he believed, appear it once more, in a new and more perfect edition, corrected and amended by the author. He was born January 6th, 1706, died 17.